experience between um, rather that anguish and pain that is caused by struggle in trying to overcome the tenacious um, old man, old animal that hangs on, okay? And uh, that causes sorrow. It causes us to mourn. And Christ said, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, the comforter is the Holy Spirit. Um, the comforter helps to reduce that agony of uh, uh, duality within um, because he gives us an existential awareness of our connectedness, first of all, to the head of the body, to, to Christ, our connectedness to him as the vine from the moment of baptism, and um, also to the other branches through him. He consoles us. Um, and he enables us, uh, uh, and again, I'll, I'll just remind you uh, of what I just said a few minutes ago, that when Christ gave that charisma to his disciples on the first day, the evening of the first day, it's basically about reconnecting people, re reconnecting the branches. Um, when the, that connection to the vine begins to weaken because baptism does not <clears throat> perform a, uh, a miracle, you know, uh, uh, of magic of some sort, you know, uh, a transform, an immediate transformation. No, what it does is it forgives any sins that we had if we baptized as adults, um, connected to the church as adults, and um, secondly, it creates uh, a foundation for constant reconnection through the mystery of um, repentance. Uh, so we are reconnected, and this is where the comforter gives that comfort, the sense of the reconnection. When we have the spirit of repentance, when we have the spirit of contrition and humility, then we feel that we are immediately reconnected to the existential unity with Christ and our brothers and sisters in the church, in the body of Christ, in the life. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this duality of life is felt not only on an individual level, but it's felt uh, collectively. Um, if we look at the history of the church, um, well, how are we to write the history of the church? What is the history of the church? Because you have two levels of, of being. The first level is, you know, the level of the, the old man. And there's plenty of that. And um, anybody who wants to pick a fight with Christians can point to, you know, countless failures by Christianity and the church, as, as people say, Historically, failures, continuous failure, failures, because that's the visible, the visible, um, very visible aspect of um, our life as Christians, you know, uh, sort of uh, journeying from perhaps a nominal level of Christianity to a more and more committed level. Um, that of necessity produces failures and falls, and um, but what the world cannot see, it, it cannot see the beauty of repentance and the beauty of that moment when the heavenly Father embraces the repentant son, the prodigal son, um, or daughter, um, in his embrace. And uh, that moment is unseen because it's private. Um, and, and it can happen, as I said, individually, but also collectively. But the church feels those moments. It feels moments when um, the comforter, um, in times when the church 
needs consolation. It, he gives that consolation. Um, I can cite examples of you know, various miracles um, during the time, difficult times for the church, both in antiquity and you know, in more recent times and say in the 20th century and to this day when the church is given these uh, signs, uh, uh, I am with you. Uh, uh, be of good cheer. Don't be discouraged. Don't get depressed. Um, don't get depressed by your failures or the seeming failure, uh, failures of the church um, collectively in, in the world. Because deep down, um, there's an unseen process that has happened. Now, I've shared this uh, story, I think, with our group. I'm sure they've shared it before, but never mind. Um, because the lineup changes, and some of you may not have heard it. Um, it's a story that probably goes back about 20, 20 25 years um, when one of our parishioners, who's now in you know, better pastures, uh, with the Lord, um, uh, uh, a person who uh, was uh, very educated, uh, you know, a, a, a university uh, teacher, a lecturer. Uh, she asked me to give her something from the history of Byzantium. So I gave her uh, a two volume set um, by. Uh, a Russian uh, historian. She read it, she gave it back to me, and she, she was quite horrified, she said, because, <laughs> like a lot of people, um, she had a rather rose colored view of what the life of the church is, you know, is about. Well, she said, wow. Were those people Christians? <laughs> the story of all the, the emperors and all the um, um, intrigues and, you know, cruelty and um, treachery, awful stuff. Um, but that's precisely that exterior. Uh, and yet, <laughs> I'm sure that all of them call themselves Christians. Okay? So... This is what the secular historian says, and this particular historian was, was secular. Uh, so that's what they pick up. They pick up all the glory <laughs> details, um, and they cannot see the mystery um, of that um, gladsome light, that you know, quiet. Father Nick's computer's frozen. We've lost, we've lost Father Nicholas in a moment of passion. Nice. <laughs> but I'm sure, I'm sure he'll be back. He'll be back in a second. Yeah. Sorry, th those of you who are joining us, um, we've just lost Father Nick. Um, not physically, just <laughs> digitally. Um, he will be back momentarily in the in the digital universe. He's calling me now. But uh, yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Just click on the link. Just click on the link again, and you'll get shot back in. Okay. All right. Uh, we have the other Father Nick now has joined us. Yes, you're back. You're back. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, failure of my Wi-Fi. Oh, uh, which, uh, sorry, I, did, I just saw your message now. But you, I can see that you're on too. I just got on there. Um, yes. Oh, yeah, okay. I thought we compliment now. 
Okay. Okay. That's all right. Um, Father Nick Karakoff is just about to finish his talk. And then we're going to Father Nick Martin. <laughs> yeah, you're a very timely appearance. Okay. Uh, just uh, finishing off and saying that, um, yeah, I gave her a model of uh, uh, the furnace of the crucible where uh, metal is, is getting melted down and there's a lot of slag on the surface. And that slag is uh, the, the superficial history of the church. But the, the beautiful molten gold down the bottom sinks to the bottom. You can't see it from, from the surface, okay? Um, so that is the, uh, the nature of uh, <clears throat> the nature of um, that duality of church life. And as I was saying, uh, uh, one of the aspects of this consolation, the comfort provided by the Holy Spirit, is to help us both individually and to cope with the process of going through this crucible, because that's us, every one of us, you know. Uh, life is not a picnic. And to transform from, uh, from old Adam to uh, the new Adam, life, uh, you know, according to Christ, well, that uh, demands, uh, you know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and sort of a, the image of the crucible. But the world can't see, can't, can only see the slag. And that's why the world um, attacks the church because, it's, well, you know, where are you Christians and where is your God? Because you can't, you can't show us anything decent. It's all rubbish. It's all muck. Uh, you're constantly failing because they can't see, as I said, the beauty of um, the beauty of repentance, um, both individual and collective. Okay. Um, now, uh, there's a beautiful short story by Alexander Solzhenitsyn called Matrona's Yar. It's a short story about um, uh, a very humble Russian babushka, you know, uh, grandma, who um, seemingly did nothing special. Um, she just carried on in her life. But when she died, everybody, uh, uh, not only her family, but all around, suddenly felt uh, that there was a vacuum. Boom. Um, and uh, this, this is the thing, that's the invisible part of um, life of the church in the Holy Spirit, um, present in many little drops, uh, droplets where, uh, of water, where the beauty of God is refracted, you know, in that rainbow of beauty, um, okay? Um, it can happen, um, and, and, and uh, the late uh, Archbishop Paul Pavlov said that when he was living in Canada, in provincial, uh, one of the uh, provinces, in a relatively small town, there was also um, an, author, uh, an elderly Orthodox lady, a little bit like this Matrana, you know, and she was a little bit eccentric in that, but when she died, this whole town, Canadians who weren't uh, uh, Orthodox, they all came to her funeral. Some of them, some of them didn't even know her name, but they, they, um, when she was alive, she they didn't notice her. When she she was gone, everybody knows, noticed it because um, she was that presence of the invisible grace of God um, in in society. You know that. The beauty um, that people yeah, they neglect, you know, and they they quick to point to the slang uh, in in Christian life. Okay, um, so uh, this is where I uh, end my talk because I said I'd talk for twenty five minutes, and I think twenty five minutes are up. So, ding gone. All right. Um. 
I we haven't had any questions come through, so I think we can move straight into um, Father Nick D's um, pre-recorded multimedia extravaganza, <laughs> and then he'll be around um, to answer questions. And whilst you're thinking, also once you whilst you're listening to Father Nick D, think about what Father Nick K has been talking about. Send through the questions. You can also, if you're on the Zoom, there's a, a on the bottom of your screen. There's a chat button, and you can ask. Um, well, about stem cells. With now I've lost Andre. I've lost Andre tonight. <laughs> about stem cells. We will uh, use a handful of words that sound technical, but they are really not all that complex. It's like speaking about fever porn now. Um, as I go, the words will hear them, and in the course of the discussion, I will explain what they are, what they mean. Um, so what are stem cells? They are the building blocks of body Parts. There are over 200 types of stem cells in the human body. For example, there are skin cells, skin cells, liver cells, kidney cells. Uh, you name it, just goes on. There are brain cells, of course. These brain cells are referred to as neurons. We'll be looking at that uh, quite specifically today. Um, and so, uh, with neurons. Um, what do they do? Well, they do a lot of things, but in our case, we'll restrict our discussion to those neurons that control body movement. They're called motor neurons. So, and uh, relating to motor neurons, there's another technical word called dopamine. <coughs> dopamine is a chemical produced by neurons. One of its effects is to control body movement. So no dopamine, we're in trouble. Uh, we'll, so we'll see how this pans out. Having said that, I actually want to read a bit from an article, a science article that I came across about a week or two. It's very, very significant. This um, it discusses current research about stem cells and create and about how stem cells create. Neurons that produce dopamine. So, um, I'll read out about four paragraphs from this article. It's very significant, and we will elaborate on what this article actually says. But I'll read this verbatim. <coughs> so, stay with me. You will understand this. In people afflicted with Parkinson's disease, neurons that produce dopamine begin to break down and die. The disease gradually produces tremors, involuntary movements, and trouble with walking, speaking, and other actions. While it, is cur while it currently can't be cured, studies are suggesting new ways to slow progression and reduce severity of the symptoms. An emerging and potentially groundbreaking treatment involves stem cells. Researchers have used stem cells to grow new dopamine producing neurons and then they transplanted them into animals. In so doing, they helped the, the so dopamine neurons in the artificially produced ones they helped restore brain circuits damaged by Parkinson's. The team started by converting human embryonic stem cells into dopamine producing neurons in a laboratory. Then they transplanted these into the brains of mice, which had Parkinson's disease. 
Within a few months, the researchers saw that the new neurons had connected to the parts of the brain responsible for motor control, body movement in other words, and the mice showed signs of improvement in their motor skills. Last para. A human clinical trial is currently underway in Japan. The two-year observation period for that study is due to end soon. The researchers say that their technique could be adapted to other types of nerve cells as well to treat different neurological disorders. So in summary for this bit, stem cells create neurons that produce dopamine. And, and dopamine is a chemical <coughs> that is needed for, for the brain to control movement. When neurons stop producing dopamine, people get Parkinson's disease. Scientists can create these new neurons using stem cell technology. <coughs> we'll now have a look at a few slides. The first one coming up is slide one. We see here a newly fertilized egg, one cell. At that stage, it's called a zygote. This happens typically uh, 16 to 20 hours after insemination. That's what we start off. So on the outside is the, is the egg. It's been penetrated by uh, sperm for, for a little while. The two remain separate, although inside. Then phase two, after 24 hours, the cell, the one single cell, divides into two, so that you can see in, uh, in Fig 2 of our presentation here. So the egg remains the same size all the time, but the cells keep dividing, so they become smaller themselves. Now we'll go across to slide 2, <clears throat> Fig 3. We see now a four-cell embryo. That happens typically after 45 hours. There are four cells. We'll just go one further here. In Fig 4, after 72 hours, the cell has now divided into eight cells. And the process goes on and on, and, but we won't go down that path. What we have here is sufficient for what I want to explain. Um, these cells, certainly at the eight cell stage, and quite likely more, um, it's just I've come across experiments where that included eight cells. What scientists did, they'd remove the shell, take the eight cells out because they're not yet connected to one another. So you now have eight individual um, um, uh, embryonic cells, they're called stem cells. Um, they then, the scientists then put uh, an artificial shell around each of these embryos, embryonic cells. Then they implant, in this case, eight separate cells into eight separate wombs, and you have eight babies being born. Had Scientists not done this at the first time when the egg was inseminated, when, it, uh, when the sperm entered. You had one egg, initially one cell. If left alone in the womb, you'd get one baby being produced, <coughs> untouched. That's the whole process goes through clearly and cleanly. If you, by doing what they did here, they showed that not only biologically that these, at this stage, these cells were uh, not related, they're independent, but also we'll see that each of these little cells had its own little soul. In other words, the original one egg, one embryo, had one soul. The soul is also in the early stages plastic. It can be pulled apart and you can produce many little souls. I might, uh, as I'm speaking, it occurred to me that the church teaches that uh, God only created one soul that was Adam's soul. And, and so from Adam, Adam's soul and Adam's body, humanity appeared. 
And it's just, I remember, I think it was uh, a former Archbishop Paul, he gave the example where you have one flame, and you uh, light a candle from that flame, another candle from that flame, they will have flames. This flame does not get extinguished, but more flames appear. That's like the equivalent to the soul spreading from Adam. And so this shows, this, this particular process that we're discussing here, shows that the soul, like the body, uh, is malleable. And so it can be multiple. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, typically, the, these, these are called embryonic stem cells. They come from embryos that are three to five days old. So at this stage, the embryo is, another technical word, is called a blastocyst. And it has about 150 cells. Okay. For decades, all sorts of experiments have been conducted with embryos, including creating human-animal hybrids, um, human cows, human pigs, human mice, human rats, all sorts of stuff that's been going on for look, certainly, certainly three decades, probably for sure more, four. Uh, anyhow, and so uh, in that scenario, after 14 days, these the creatures would be destroyed. Um, but we won't be discussing that at all beyond what I've just said. Um, the thing I'm aiming at uh, to emphasize here is that the reason scientists are permitted to do these experimentations is the belief, the notion that the embryo is not a human being. At the very best, it's uh, considered to be a potential human being. And because it's not a full human being, you can experiment with that. And this is what's, what's been going on, and including in the, what we'll be covering now, the uh, stem cell um, technology to, in this example, to cure Parkinson's disease, but there are other diseases as well. Now, to, just to emphasize, um, this, the fact that at no stage is the, from conception to birth, at no stage is there an actual border where you say that at this stage it's not a human embryo, but now it is. That doesn't happen. And I'll quote, um, I'll give a brief explanation, an extract from the book written by uh, Lee Silver, that was back in 1999 from memory. <clears throat> He's a professor of, at Princeton University in the Department of Molecular Biology, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, plus I think called the Program of Neuroscience. So here we will look at slide three and uh, I will read this, but I want you to read that with me. So we'll go through it slowly. And you'll see the slide as I'm speaking. Uh, so there's a couple of quotes from him. <clears throat> In the field of human reproduction, the word embryo no longer applies to cells that exist during the first two weeks after fertilization. Instead, they're now called pre-embryos. Okay. So for the first two weeks, they're no longer called embryos, they're called pre-embryos, so even lesser human. <clears throat> I'll continue. These are, quotes, these are words from Lee Silver. <clears throat> he says, I'll let you in on a secret. The term pre-embryo has been embraced by IVF practitioners for reasons that are political, not scientific. Why? to allay moral concerns that might be expressed by IVF patients. There is no particular part of the development process that is more important than another. All are part of a continuous process. From fertilization to baby birth, nothing stands out as being um, specific and more important than something else. The last bit from Lee Silver. If we decide 
that the embryo is deserving of the same protection as a child, we might want to think carefully not only about abortion, but about kinds of embryonic manipulations as in the, in the laboratory. Right, so, and to summarise so far this bit, um, we see that a single fertilised egg implanted in the womb produces one baby. Point one. Next bit. After three days, the fertilised egg contains eight embryonic cells. Third bit. These cells can be separated artificially and implemented, we discuss this, implemented into eight wombs, thereby producing eight babies. This confirms that each individual cell is now an embryo in its own right. Okay. And Lee Silver explains that there is no moment in time where the stem cells are not embryos. The embryos from the gun to the end. Embryonic stem cells, they only have the ability to become individual embryos for a short period of time. Then they start to specialise, they start to connect to the surrounding cells and then they start to specialise and down the track they cease to be embryonic cells. Uh, in the end when full body parts are created, they are now called adult stem cells. Right. Okay, so here's a schematic diagram showing what happens. We start off in the middle there uh, with those embryonic stem cells, each individual one, and left alone, they then start to specialise. It's called cell differentiation. So some of the cells become nerve cells, others become muscle cells, and others become heart cells, liver cells, and it goes on. No, we, we, there's this, uh, hundreds of them, different types. Um, so uh, the, the, these nerve cells, muscle cells, and liver cells, they are now adult cells. So there's no problem doing experiments in the laboratory that use adult stem cells. The issue is when they are still in the early phase are embryonic. Each embryonic stem cell, as I mentioned, is an embryo in its own right. And when the embryo is trans when the embryo is transformed chemically and artificially into body parts, that embryo is killed. And this is what we'll see. Have a look at slide five. It's the same, it's no different in principle to slide four. In slide four, right in the middle, we just showed the stem cells themselves. Now, this is no different to replacing that central image of stem cells with a fetus. And that's what I've got drawn here. So, what's happening is that effectively we are transforming that fetus using um, technology to change from continuing to be born into a baby to change it and it becomes a, a an adult cell. So each time that happens, this little baby that you see there is killed in the process. Can you see where I'm getting to? So we started off with stem cells, it sounds oh, no big deal, that's a cell. But in fact, as Lee Silver pointed out, there is no moment when it becomes uh, an embryo, when it becomes a, a fetus, when it becomes a baby. It's one continuous process. It's the same thing. And so if you destroy uh, um, embryonic stem cells, you're destroying each embryonic uh, stem cell is a little baby that is destroyed. So now we come to the interesting part. <clears throat> Prior to researching 
how many stem cells are used actually in, in these experiments that researchers do. And my gut feel was that, look, uh, I felt maybe, maybe, maybe 10,000, even if you stretch it, maybe a million stem cell, embryonic stem cells uh, destroyed. And, and then eventually I came, I think it was yesterday, across some data figures shown from the University of Utah. In this case, they were looking, uh, experimenting with what are called blood marrow cells, but it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about blood marrow or any of the other cells. It's the process that, that's involved. And the, the figures that they to speak about, they are indicative of the sort of things that we can expect in other areas of experimentation. So we will have a look at slide six. This is an extract from the Utah University. This is what they say. The ideal number of stem cells needed is between five and 10 million per kilogram of the person's weight. That's the, the ideal number. The bare minimum number is between one and two million stem cells per kilogram of a person's weight. Now, the big deal here is per dose. So if you need to say 10 doses, you multiply this figure by 10. I don't know how many doses are involved. And so I've done this little teeny weeny bit of mathematics here. Say a person weighs 80 kilograms. We'll look at the minimum number where it's between one and two. We'll look at one million. So if we multiply one million stem cells, embryonic ones, by 80 kilograms, we find that there will be 80 million embryos killed per dose. If we look at the ideal scenario where the university says uh, the figure hopefully was between 5 and 10 million, if we take 10 million, we find and multiply 10 million stem cells by the weight of the person, 80 kilograms, and we get 800 million babies killed per dose. And if there are 10 doses, it's 8,000 million. That's a number of people on the planet. Do you understand why it's important to, uh, to comprehend what on earth is going on? Why it's important for clergy in particular, but parents as well, and their ch subsequent children, for them to understand what's going on. Because this is, a, I'll give you now a scenario that you can expect in the Orthodox Church at least. It's very common for pious parishioners when they have some uh, serious issue that uh, they have to attend to in their life. They will go up to the priest and say, Father, bless me, I need an operation or uh, I need to do this, I need to do this, and it's very uh, significant. I've lost my job, I can't find work. Can we do a little service to St. Xenia of Petersburg to help us? And, and the priest says, well, of course. And the parishioner, all she's told or he's told is that we can cure your grandmother's or your mother's Parkinson's disease. We'll just use a bit of stem cell therapy. And because there's so many stem cells, that is, there are the embryonic adult, but there's other ones in between as well. So the, the doctor's not going to say we're going to uh, use, we're going to kill little embryos to fix up Parkinson's disease uh, that your mother has. The doctor will say, we'll just uh, extract uh, some eggs from the, the woman. We'll fertilize that, the sperm. We'll produce stem cells, we'll um, then multiply these stem cells and we will use that to cure, not cure even, to reduce the trembling and the consequences of Parkinson's disease. So to heal 
or at least to help a person suffering from a disease or other neurological diseases that were mentioned, uh, I didn't just uh, mention those, but that included even things like diabetes for goodness sake. So to help one person um, to either get healed or helped medically, you can talk potentially 8,000 million embryos dying during the communist revolution in Russia over 70 years, typical figures that are quoted that over the period of time some 25 million people got killed and that's of course horrific and you mentioned that uh, certainly in the church scenario to any priest or bishop or, or monk or seminarian and I of course will all agree horror shock correctly and yet they, are, they can be uh, complicit in the death of hundreds of millions of embryos. Now the church teaches that at Christ's second coming when there's a resurrection of everybody, even these little babies that were aborted or miscarried, they will now be, they got their own souls and they will eventually have the appearance of a 33-year-old adult. So this is the essence of this lecture, to point out that it's not good enough for people, again, in particular my brother, priests, uh, to sort of say, well, science is, that's all very well, it's nice, it's out there, we can look at the trees and look at the beautiful flowers and smell the roses. And that certainly shows it's God's work. It's beyond that. We're talking about life and death. This is why knowledge about science is critical. And so uh, if you're looking at young families, their, their toddler children don't need to know about science. But by golly, when they grow up into be a mid-teenage, it starts to kick in. And especially when the world tells them that this is a new reality and they start to believe, then they'll fall away from their faith. And so it's time now to, for the church, I'm speaking in general, all Orthodox churches and in fact indeed all Christian churches, to, to take this new world that we're living on board and understand we have to address issues that in the past were not even dreamt of. Um, so that, that's yes, and this is the essence of today's talk to show this is one example of why we need to know basic science. Okay. Was that? Uh, that's where it finished. Yep. Trying to unmute Father Nick Dillinkevich. <laughs> he keeps, he's still muted. Chris, can you try and... I can ask him to unmute. <laughs> All right, Father Nick Dillinkevich, you've got to, you've got to unmute yourself. So where that, where the red little, he's trying, I think. <laughs> Is that Kenya? Ah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You're on. Gotcha. You're on. Yeah, well, well. I can't understand this because yesterday, last night, Dean sent me a, a copy of this video, this talk, and it was as clear as daylight. It was a 